All right, guys. Today we're gonna be reacting to why were the Nazi so stylish? Secrets history revealed. Well, the, yeah. You know what's crazy? They always look nice and neat. Nice and neat. Everything looks nice. Everything looks expensive. Isn't that crazy? I would like to know why. I would love to know why. It's a very interesting video from the channel. Real men, real style. <laughs> Let's see what's going on. And make sure you like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Also, if you guys want to donate to the channel, just hit the super chat button. That really helps with a little uh, dollar symbol. I don't know if in Euro, it's just a Euro symbol. I don't know. But just hit it. That really helps the channel. Let's jump in. The power of a uniform lies in its silence. Hmm. So I made a video a few months back ranking the world's best looking uniforms. Now, of course, my beloved Marine Corps ended up on top, but I couldn't help but notice in the comments a number of people brought up, what about the SS uniforms? What about Nazi uniforms? Now, as a bit of a World War II history buff and a guy here on YouTube that talks about men's style, I thought, who better to answer the question? Why were the Nazis so stylish? stylish. Seriously, the SS uniforms haven't been worn for coming in on 80 years. Wow. Yet, people still talk about them. Yeah, yeah that's the crazy. They look, look at that, man. That ever made. That so looks, why are the SS uniforms so iconic? Find out, gents. In right on video. top, man. So to understand why the German uniforms, specifically the SS uniforms of World War II, are so iconic, we need to go back and look at the unification of Germany in 1871. Otto von Bismarck basically unified the German states to defeat the French and in 1871 unified all of these oh, we different have Schubert states that spoke a similar language. Hey, we have Schubert in the background. Let's go. Sonata in A minor, sec, uh, the slow movement, F sharp minor. Mm. Which, but had very different looking militaries, very different customs into one country, Germany. Now for the next 40 years, German uniforms were all over the place in terms of makeup, color, mm. the way that they were put together. Uh, pretty much the only common thing we saw in a lot of these uniforms was the famous pickle helmet, you know, pickle, with the spike yep. on top. That right there was pretty much the standard until 1910. What happened? All of a sudden, we saw a standard go across the German Empire. Basically, you needed to conform to gray. Now, this was a practical move. All the colors before really symbolized particular units, allowed commanders to be able to see what's going on in the battlefield. But as war changed, all of a sudden we started heading into World War I. Really, it was going to be something with trench warfare. It was something where maneuver and having the generals right there on the field maneuvering just wasn't going to happen. So we saw things going towards practicality, going towards a less expensive material, something that could be mass produced and worn by an entire nation. Mm. By 1915, we're a year in into World War One, and all of a sudden, all those flamboyant uniforms, all those colors, all that's gone out the window for practicality. In fact, you really couldn't see much difference between enlisted men and officers. Uniforms had become very simple, very clean. Very simple. And by clean, I don't mean free of dirt. I mean simply there was nothing to grab onto. All of a sudden, it was like if it was excess material, if it was something that could get snagged down in the trenches, you got rid of it. In fact, that pickle helmet all of a sudden was gone in 1916, wow. and we saw the introduction of the famous helmet which would go on to serve the German military for a long time, known as the Stahlhelm. Now, in 1918, Germany surrendered. The Great War was over. You had millions of soldiers returning. All of a sudden, the military went down to a force of about 100,000. And uniforms during the next 10 years, they really didn't go anywhere. In fact, it was just things left over from the Great War. They really didn't have the money. Hyperinflation was picking up, and this was just a tough time for the military and its uniforms in general. That being said, things started to change in the late 1920s, early 1930s, as we saw the German rearmament program come up. So this is all of a sudden the rise of the Nazi party. All of a sudden, it is a priority to make Germany strong, to make Germany proud. And all of a sudden, we see the military uniforms start to get a makeover, get money put into them. This was just something they're getting better materials. All of a sudden, they're getting things to fit. Now, I've got to be honest, there's nothing to me extraordinary about the regular German military uniform in the 1930s and throughout World War II. This is something that it looks good. but It looks okay. It looks like a regular uniform, but heavy. For me, it just looked heavy. But I think there are a lot of other uniforms out there that would give it a run for its money. 
but the SS uniform, that is something different. Yeah. Now at this point, some of you guys may be asking, oh, wait a minute, isn't the SS part of the German military? Technically, no. The SS was a paramilitary organization and initially started off very small, the Hall Guards. Basically, these were the bodyguards for Hitler. Hitler, at, when he rose to power, he didn't have the trust of the military. He was always suspect of it. So he wanted to have his own group, his group right around him that trusted him, was loyal directly to Hitler and protected him. But the SS was the organization in which we think about those black uniforms. The mm. symbolism, such as you know the death's head, the SS symbol right there, that is what I'm talking about mostly in today's video. Now Heinrich Himmler was the head of the SS and it was divided into three parts. You had the General SS and their job was to make sure that all of the Nazi policies were enforced throughout Germany. Then you had the armed SS and this is where a lot of military confusion comes in because these guys would fight right next to military units but they didn't usually have like tanks or any artillery or anything like that. They were more of foot soldiers but they could also go in and they, they would go through and sometimes clean up afterwards hence all the atrocities that are attributed with them. These were the hardcore Nazis. In fact that third group, the death's head units, these were the guys in charge of the concentration camps. Now the SS was evil. That's beyond debate. Wow. When we look at the millions and millions and millions of Slavs, Jews, just Poles, people killed throughout the world by the SS. I mean, it's horrible. Yet a hundred years later, we are still ranking their look, their uniform as one of the most. Isn't that interesting? I think one thing doesn't have to be with the other. One thing doesn't really have to correlate with the other, right? So this, it just happens to be kind of a thing. Stylish that many people have ever seen. Why uniform was a good product. It was well designed. Wow, look at that. It was adorned <laughs> with recognizable symbols and it was modeled by fit individuals. Now that reason alone could have propelled this uniform to stardom, but there were two other reasons of why this uniform became iconic. Next up, we've got exposure. This is the reason these uniforms became iconic even in their own time period. Basically, you had Germany in the 1930s and even throughout the war using propaganda. They had propaganda ministers. They had filmmakers come in and they put these uniforms in the best light possible. Mm. And finally, let's talk about reinforcement and repetition. So the reason these uniforms are iconic today is because they keep popping up on the screen. Hollywood keeps reaching back and pulling these they things. They look badass, out. man. They love the symbolism. They love the look. Again, it's- they look, they look very badass. I'm not gonna lie. They look very nice. A good product. Nice and clean. So when they put it out there, it's very easy for us to be able to spot the bad guy. It's very easy for us to see some, the villain, because he's dressed in black. So let's go deeper on the design of the SS uniform and start this off by dispelling one of the biggest myths out there. And that is Hugo Boss did not design the SS uniform. They manufactured these uniforms. They made them, but they did not design them. Now the mm. designer was actually a relatively unknown Nazi designer by the name of Karl Diebich. Now Diebich was an early Nazi sympathizer joining the party in 1920s. And if you know your history in the 1920s, the Nazi party had some ups and downs, a number of members killed. In the 1930s though, he came back oh. and rejoined his unique skills to work designing uniforms with another gentleman named Walter Heck. Now, as good as these Nazi designers possibly were, what made them really smart is that they stole timeless designs. Mm. These guys didn't reinvent the wheel. They didn't start from scratch. They actually reached into history and pulled out symbols and colors that had worked. Now, why the color black was chosen? Man, look at that, bro. That looks nice and clean, bro. Wow. It looks like they spent a lot of money doing this design. And there's a few theories right. out there. Some people say secretive societies and just that the color black had that mystery, had that look they were searching for. Other people say they were inspired by the Jesuits. If you know anything about that Catholic organization, a little bit of, you know, the higher educated, basically the higher class. My belief is that they stole from their own history. Check out this guy, August von oh. Mackensen. He was a living military legend in the 1930s. A field marshal during World War I Notice the skull and crossbones right there in the hat. You can't miss it. What does this symbolize? For many people, it symbolizes death. But for others, it's a symbol of a rejection of death, of spitting in death's face, that you take no prisoners and that you will not be taken alive. Now, at the height of the power of the SS, it can be argued that its leader, Heinrich Himmler, was the second most powerful man in Germany right next to Adolf Hitler. 
If you think about it, here's a guy that had no prior military experience, was relatively young for the position he had, and had a big feeling of inadequacy. In fact, there's a lot of stories that talk about just Goebbels and all these generals just kind of, you know, laughing that, because he was, if you look at his uniform and the details on his uniform, he was trying to put anything he could on there. He didn't have mm. medals from the war. And he started going down that slippery slope of trying to look like he was decorated, yet he truly wasn't a combat veteran. Part of the whole symbolism that went into making sure those uniforms were immaculate and the best ones out there was because of the inadequacies that Himmler felt. Now, this next symbol is probably the most recognizable Nazi symbol in the world, and that is the swastika. But what's interesting here, and just like all the other symbols I'm talking about, the Nazis didn't come up with this. They stole this. And in fact, the word swastika in Sanskrit means conductive to well-being. This was a good... Swastika. Ah, oh, that is interesting, right? Light and love. Is it a symbol that looks good or I being brainwashed to think it's bad? You see what I'm saying? Like I might be, of course, related with the Nazis and I can just make that distinction and connect the symbol with the Nazi make me, make me look at that symbol wrong. You see what I'm saying? Good luck charm. You look throughout Asia, you throughout parts of the world for a long, for hundreds and hundreds of years. This symbol has been out oh. there and it's been something that you see on temples, you see being used, and it always meant something good until in the 1930s, the Nazis took this over and yeah, it all went downhill. Now, why this symbol just looks so striking on this uniform is the use of color and contrast. We've got a black, wow, uniform, look at that. a very stark wow. color. All of a sudden you're- Wow, look at that. Bring that in looks beautiful, a power right? Red with the white. This combination right here, that red, white, black on a black <laughs> uniform, is striking, grabs wow. attention, very easy to spot. And now let's talk about the symbol of the Schutzstaffel, aka the SS. By the way, gents, that was not easy for me to pronounce. I don't even know if I got close, but I appreciate you giving a like to today's video if you like these deeper history videos. I've got a whole list of them I want to create, but I want to hear from you guys if you like videos like this. Now, the SS was based off an ancient rune, and that rune symbolized the sun. What they did is they turned it, and they actually changed a bit of history and said, no, no, this thing actually represents victory. So, you saw the SS, which represented the name of the unit, but it also represented victory, victory. And the guy mm -hmm. behind this, remember that graphic designer, Walter Heck, we talked about earlier? Yeah. yeah, he had a hand in this. And on an interesting wow. side note, this symbol became so powerful in Germany that they actually adjusted their typewriters to have the symbol on it. <laughs> so at this point, we have the uniforms designed, we have these amazing symbols. Now let's go into Hugo Boss. So he did manufacture the uniforms, and the way it works is a lot of manufacturers, they don't do the designs. They actually take the design and then they execute on it. And this was also a time period when a lot of clothing was made specifically for the individuals. I know when I was in the Marine Corps, it was something I could go to the Marine shop and I would pay extra and I would have the uniform tailored and cut to me. This was a big thing, especially in the 1930s. And if you were also going to be filmed, if you were going to be at an event that Hitler was going to be at, you made sure everything was adjusted. Tailoring was big. Mm. And that is a big part why when we see these pictures that the uniforms just look amazing. Not only were they well designed, but they were on fit young men who had these, this clothing tailored to fit them. And on a side note, Hugo Boss actually died in 1948. His son took over the company and him and his business partners turned it into the giant, you know, brand that it ended up becoming in the 1970s, wow, 80s, man, and 90s. Gentlemen, but what's interesting <laughs> is you go back and you look at in 1945 wow. during the denazifying process, which they would make you take all these classes, basically figure out how, what level of a Nazi you were. He was actually considered to be one of the lower level and went through and paid a fine. And he didn't pay a fine because he had worked with the Nazis. He paid a fine because he used 150 slave laborers. In fact, it can be argued the greatest thing the Hugo Boss company ever did was rebrand itself. But damn, those Germans do make some good fragrances. So we can see I that they had a great one. product. Now let's talk about exposure and what was happening. Yeah, he said he said they're good. Okay, I believe him. In the late 1920s, 1930s, we saw the explosion of media. All of a sudden, you could film something and you could show it on the other side of the world and people could actually see what was there. This was something totally new. Germany was taking full advantage of this. They not only had people that worked in propaganda, they had a huge propaganda budget. As an artist or a former artist, you know, Hitler knew the power of image, the power 
of this huge fan of Wagner too, man. Wagner, if you listen to Wagner music, oh, the, one of the best um, retinudos of opera introductions, uh, Tom Hausers, Tom Vosers, Tom Vosers, Tom Vosers, I think is the name of it. Tom Vosers, great, one of my favorite um, opera retinudos. Uh, if you can listen to it, mm, 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 it just really touched the soul, man. This new thing called video, and he wanted to make sure Richard, the world Richard. saw Germany as he wanted Richard. it to be seen. Voxner. Propaganda becomes ineffective the moment we become aware of it. Now, if you've studied World War II in Nazi Germany, you've heard of Joseph Goebbels, but not as many people know that he was the minister of propaganda. I mean, what is that? What country? I mean, you look through most countries, they don't have a minister of propaganda. This was unheard of at a time when all of a sudden media was exploding. The power that Goebbels had here was amazing. Now, Goebbels was a politician, and politicians were as bad then as they are now. They're not good at making anything except making themselves so look yeah. good at our expense. No, he had a secret weapon. Actually, it wasn't his, it was Hitler's. Does the name Lenny Reifenstahl ring a bell? Most likely not. She's one of those Nazis that isn't really talked about, yet she had a huge impact in the way that the world saw Nazi Germany in the 1930s. To me, what makes Lenny so interesting is that she was a true believer. In 1932, she saw Hitler speak and she just hook, line and sinker bought into what the guy was saying. She talked about it was like a religious experience. She talked about having a vision. Wow. This was a very talented woman. This was what, someone that was at the forefront of making movies, somebody that had real skill. She got introduced to Hitler. Hitler absolutely loved what she talked about. He f had a deep connection. In fact, Himmler would become very jealous of the relationship because she could go directly to Hitler. And all of a sudden, he started painting his ideas of how he wanted this idea for a film to be. She was given a budget and all of a sudden, she started making propaganda films that did not, for most people, didn't even seem like propaganda. Wow. The film's Victory of the Faith, the film Triumph of the Will, these would go on to be watched by millions around the world and inspire many people of German descent to return to Germany and serve in the military. She was also commissioned to film the 1936 Summer Olympics in Berlin, where for the first time ever, she was using tracking shots on athletes and a film came out of that called Olympia, which was very well received. And she even caught the famous footage of Jesse Owens winning his gold medals. Now, wow. once Germany invaded Poland, a lot of her work slowed down. She actually did accompany German troops into Poland and filmed some of that, but ended up returning. A lot of the propaganda all of a sudden started coming directly into Germany, making sure that the people, you know, weren't aware of what's going on outside the world, keeping them very focused in on their mission. Point being is we had fanatics. We had people that truly believed they were right with talent, with skill, creating films that they felt were authentic. And when people watch this stuff, they believed it was authentic, and that which is, that's what's so scary about it. That's scary because you can't see it. It's so subtle that you cannot see it. You cannot see it right as a, uh, in, the, in your conscious, right? Not subconscious because that's where the propaganda really works, when it's thrown at you through the subconscious. But when it's conscious, you can see it, it doesn't work. About this. Again, you had a great product. You had, you know, people that were pushing this with a very, with a huge budget around the world up to the start of the war. And now let's talk about repetition. Let's talk about what Hollywood feeds us. So when Hollywood needs a bad guy, who do they pull on? They pull on the Nazis. They pull on the SS. Because first up, I mean, all bad guys wear black, right? So it fits in with the stereotype. And they just bring in great looking uniforms. Oftentimes we have very charismatic actors. We like to have a good villain. It makes for a good movie. And again and again, it's reinforced that these guys dress well, that uh -huh. they are very, you know, and that's what makes them seem so evil in a lot of these movies, is that they are smart, they are intelligent, and at the slightest, without any hesitation, they will kill you. And this is something that Hollywood again and again repeats and put it out there. So it's always top of mind. It's always something that we're seeing. It's something that again and again is imprinted on us. And if marketing will tell you anything, repetition, repetition, repetition. It creates sales and it keeps them top of mind. So whenever we're thinking about a uniform, we just go Nazi. back to this one we just saw in a movie a few months back. Wow, yeah, look at that. But well, it looks Nazi good, man. SS hey, hey. As hey, for my hey. personal Even if you make it look bad, it looks good, man. Opinion, not that this video didn't have a lot of that, 
I do think they are very strong, striking uniforms. When I look at these, I'm like, wow, this is power. Oh, this that, is dark. This is definitely the uniform of somebody that you know, wants to send that signal of intimidation. Black is a color that does that power, aggression. Do I think they're one of the top uniforms of all time? Probably not. I do definitely think they are uh, a bit overrated for what it is. Ooh, but he kept guys, it real. He kept it real. He was not playing. I want to hear from you. What's your opinion? Well, my opinion is that those uniform looks top shape. I, I know our Marine uniform looks good. The Chil the, Chil the Chileans. Uh, Chileans. Uh, Ch Chilianos. I don't know how to say that in English. They look good. They look good as well. But let me know what you guys see in the comment section below. I would like to hear you guys' opinion. I will see you in the next one.